Now on to my talk entitled, as you can see, it was mentioned before, Brexit, Legal Views um, from Canada and Ireland. So yes, I'm a lawyer, I'm a jurist. So my angle to considering Brexit um, is very much legal, but not in its technicalities, at least not the way I'll cover it tonight, I promise. My focus and my lecture tonight will focus on the legal challenge to Brexit, but with a clear underlying theme. Let me cl be clear um, about it at the outset. The theme is the role of um, the judiciary, of courts, in our society, in our systems govern based on the rule of law, which is, of course, at the core of the court's mission to protect and to defend. The rule of law, instead of the arbitrary rule of man, something um, at the basis of um, modern state, state um, governance, something required for stability also, which in turn is needed for business. So business people in the audience, this is also for you. My hypothesis is that there are lessons from Canada and Ireland to help um, with the deadlock of the Brexit legal challenge. In short, it's got to do with the democratic principle, which would improve, I believe, greatly the credibility of the courts as a valuable player in major um, public debates, as the ultimate and respectable guardian for the courts to be the guardian of our rule of law. For my demonstration, a little bit of background first. I won't dwell upon the Brexit referendum of last June, just a few numbers to recall. 52% was for leave in the whole of the UK. Uh, but in Scotland, 62% um, of the population was against Brexit. And in Northern Ireland, 56%. Now, the legal challenge, or rather the legal challenges, because there were two the main one in London, and another one based on the Good Friday Agreement in Belfast. I'll concentrate on the first one, especially now that they um, are both merged for the purpose of the appeal before the UK Supreme Court. Um, essentially, the issue whether or not the government, without Parliament, could proceed unilaterally to trigger Brexit, pursuant to Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union. But as promised, I will not go in the technicalities of our Article 50. Suffice it to say that at first instance, the High Court in London, a panel of three judges, in a decision early November, um, answered no to the government. Theresa May's government cannot proceed unilaterally without the involvement of Parliament to trigger Brexit. By the way, handed down um, shortly before the London decision uh, in late October was the Belfast decision, which reached a different conclusion but deferred to the London case with regard to the main issue, that is, of whether or not Parliament needs to be involved. The high, the high Court decision, of course, is very thoroughly reasoned based on pretty much all the most important <coughs> constitutional principles in the common law tradition. Sovereignty of Parliament, separation of powers, the prerogative of the Crown with regard to international affairs, and of course the rule of law. But let me suggest uh, that there is a huge element missing, a sort of what I like to call um, an elephant in the room in the November decision, namely the democratic principle. Nowhere except towards the end of this decision when the court barely mentioned um, the existence of a referendum with regard to Brexit, um, mentioned in no more than two paragraphs the traditional understanding that referenda in the common law tradition are non-binding. Nowhere else did the court seriously give weight to the will of the people as expressed on the occasion of the Brexit referendum last June. In other words, it considered, the court considered, the legal challenge of Brexit solely in view 
of extremely important constitutional principles, but those principles did not include the democratic principle as part of the equation. The result, in a way, is that a sort of dichotomy, in my opinion, was created. The Constitution versus the Brexit referendum. In terms of actor, the judges versus the people. And by extension, the elite versus the ordinary folks. So it was easy and totally predictable, I believe, that as a result, the media would jump on this aspect in their coverage. So some of uh, examples of press coverage um, the day after the decision was rendered by The Guardian. I'm surprised, relatively sober. The Independent, maybe sober, but maybe less serious too. Now we're going with the Daily Express. No photo, but the message is clear. Now on to the Daily Mail. Enemy of the people, the faces of the three judges. Very striking, I mean, from, because uh, we share the same uh, common law tradition at home in, in, in Canada, nowhere uh, did we ever see the identity in such a way um, emphasized upon following a controversial court decision. And of course, this, maybe in black and white, but says it all. The judges versus the people. Now, let me tell you that, um, or suggest to you, that this type of news coverage is not good. Not good for the credibility of the judiciary in our modern liberal democracies. Not good for the guardian of the rule of law as a fundamental principle of governance in our society. Not good either for legal certainty, for legal stability. And by extension, not good for business, because it's the same people that are supposed to be credible in deciding cases, be it in contract law, or in commercial trades, etc. Now, what can we learn from Canada in terms of participation of the judiciary in major public debates, including how to reconcile the democratic principle with the rest of the constitutional order, and not to oppose them? Canada celebrates, it was mentioned earlier, its uh, 150th anniversary in 2017, along with uh, another celebration, 35 years of our Bill of Rights, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom. Double reasons to rejoice, as a lawyer at least. As far as its jurisprudence is concerned, Canada has had many occasions to see its highest court participate in major public debates. Just to give a few examples, it was a court decision in 1930 uh, that said that women were persons, persons eligible to be appointed to the Senate of Canada. Also in 1980, when Canada, many say finally, completed its process of emancipation uh, from Great Britain with the so-called patriation of the Constitution, it was the Supreme Court of Canada that set out the procedure. Ottawa could not proceed unilaterally. It had to have the support of most provinces. And it did in the end, nine out of 10. The dissenting one being Quebec, that's a long story for another day. Now, the prime example of judicial participation in major public debates that I want to use for my demonstration is the 1998 decision in the Quebec secession case. Again here, no need, no time for the detailed background, just to say that the province of Quebec had a second referendum on independence in 1995, which was lost, uh, but by an extremely thin margin at 49.4%. The rule for conducting referenda and more generally for secession of a province, those rules were never made clear. Hence, the reference to the Supreme Court of Canada, where there were three questions asked. Whether a UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence, was legal under Canadian constitutional law, first question. Second, whether a UDI was legal under international law. And thirdly, in case of conflict, 
what law should prevail? The answer to the first two questions was no. So it made the third question moot, of course. And for my purposes, it is in answering the first question, whether a UDI is legal under Canadian constitutional law, that I want to emphasize to show how the Supreme Court of Canada was created um, and how its legal reasoning was very wise indeed, going above and beyond black letter constitutional law, being the court innovative and well balanced. It basically said this, that strictly speaking, there is no right to secession for Quebec under Canadian constitutional law. However, the rest, the same breath in the same paragraph, it continued by emphasizing that the rest of Canada cannot remain indifferent to a clear expression, to a clear desire to leave the Federation. Therefore, a clear majority on a clear question would trigger an obligation to negotiate a new status for Quebec. Now, that's the answer. How did the Supreme Court reach this conclusion? Well, it, is, it was by identifying four underlying principles of our constitutional legal order. Nothing in black letter constitutional law, but going deeper, it rationalized in its reasons for judgment, four principles. First of all, federalism, the rule of law, protection of minority, and the democratic principle. The latter democratic principle um, that gives high importance to the will of the people, expressed by means of a referendum. Hence, the idea of the rest of Canada not being able to sit on its hand and not reacting, even if, strictly speaking, there was no right to unilateral uh, secession under Canadian constitutional law. It went beyond black letter law. Now, that, in my opinion, um, was wise, was well-balanced, the reasons of the court for judgment in the Quebec reference case did not oppose democracy to the constitutional order. It included as one of the, mo uh, of the four most important underlying principles, the democratic principles, as an underlying one. That's what the High Court in London, in the decision early um, November, did not do in its Brexit legal challenge decision. But hopefully, at the UK Supreme Court, in its decision, expected early this year, hopefully before self-imposed deadline of March, if I recall correctly, um, might actually, with all due respect, do a better job in um, identifying what, it is, what is at the core, even if not traditionally because of the importance of sovereignty of Parliament in the UK constitutional tradition but somehow try to reconcile that with the modern role of referenda in governance. Although I'm afraid I was down uh, in London for the hearings uh, early December, and I did not um, hear any of the arguments, actually, uh, or the questions put to the lawyers uh, going in that direction. Um, now, on to the legal views from the Republic of Ireland. Um, what was striking for a Canadian scholar um, learning uh, for the first time of, the, um, uh, of constitutional law in Ireland is how it is close but yet so different from um, UK constitutional law. Um, we in Canada like to think that we inherited, um, it, it, it is said in explicit terms in, in our preamble that the principles of UK constitutional order apply to Canada, but with the big caveat uh, adjustment with regard to the reality of a federation, of course. Now, the main aspect of my research in UCC um, was really to understand uh, to, to, to realize and then understand the importance of referenda in the uh, Irish constitutional legal uh, system. 
Um, referenda, maybe not quite as often as in Switzerland, but seems to be something of a regular use um, in, um, in Ireland. Um, this part of my work is not completed. Um, I'll continue uh, my research and, and, and eventually, though, I want to include the Irish example as something that um, of a story of, of success in including, adjusting UK inherited uh, common law constitutional, broad constitutional principles with uh, modernity of uh, governance according to referenda from time to time when it deals, if my understanding is, is correct, um, with any significant legal issue, those enshrined in the Irish constitution, any change must be endorsed by referenda. Of course, we have in mind a uh, place the first that we're striking from a, a foreigner's point of view is the numerous referenda on in relation with, with, with the EU that you conducted here. But I also understood that there are many other issues of uh, human rights, of children rights. Um, the one on same-sex marriage in 2015 is a recent example. But the bottom line is, is this, the democratic principle in Ireland is very strong indeed via the institution of referendum, gauging, making sure to gauge when issues are deemed important enough um, because of a link to the Constitution to make sure that the will of the people goes along with the political decision. And again, to conclude, this is something that the UK, hopefully in the Supreme Court decision dealing with Brexit legal challenge should, should better consider to include explicitly uh, in its reasons for judgment. Among other things, um, it would most likely help greatly in uh, rehabilitating sorry, the judiciary as a legitimate participant in major public debates. This is, I remind you, the underlying theme of my lecture today. And in the end, it would make a world of difference, I would submit, for good governance of the country based on the rule of law. Thus brushing aside, in part at least, the bogus, I consider, dichotomy or um, overvalued uh, dichotomy between the elite and the ordinary folks. Judges would better consider and would be seen as taking into account in a better way the will of the people as part of what is considered at the core of the UK constitutional order. I thank you very much. <laughs>